now that we understand the central limit theorem for means, we need to understand the central limit theorem for proportions. And to do that, we'll have to look at the sampling distribution for proportions as well. So let's think about proportions for a second. We looked at them a little bit a while ago, but we want to take them on again. So the population proportion is the proportion of a population that has a certain characteristic, the thing that you're looking for, the success, one might say. And then the sample proportion is the proportion of the sample who have those characteristics. So what's the difference between these two? Well, this one's for a population, so it's about the population. So that's P for the population, the population proportion. P hat, he has a little hat on his head, is the sample proportion. Now, that symbol might be looking a little familiar to you, P, P hat. We did look at this one other time, and that was in section 6.2, binomial distribution, because this is very much related to the binomial distribution. So we have P hat is X over N, where X is the number of successes. Remember that terminology from the binomial distribution, and that's divided by N, the number of observations or trials. In section 6.2, we talked about them as trials, but I can tell you that StatCrunch says observations, right? So this terminology is from StatCrunch. This terminology is from section 6.2, but they mean the same thing. It's the sample size, right? It's the sample size. So this is the number um, with characteristic, right? With the thing you're looking for, characteristic divided by your sample size. Always keep in mind that n should be larger than x, right? n is your sample size. Oh, I just wrote it right there, <laughs> the number of the characteristic, right? n should be larger than x because your proportion, right, p, p hat, must be less than 1. Right, has to be a decimal between 0 and 1. We learned that in chapter 5, right? Proportions have to be between 0 and 1. All right, so let's look at this bit down here. What is the sampling distribution of sample proportions? So now that we know what proportions are, right, how does the sampling distribution work? So let's look at an example. We're interested in studying iPhone usage among U.S. college students. A 2016 large study found that 69% of all U.S. college students have an iPhone. So we will assume that the population proportion is, okay, so 69% of all college students, that's P, right? So this is your population proportion. Population, it says all right there. <laughs> so population proportion. So P is 0.69, where it's assumed to be. Now, when I was in class, when I did this, I did this in a face-to-face -face class, and I asked, you know, how many students were there and how many students had an iPhone that day. I had 19 students in class, so that was my sample size, N was 19. And then the number with an iPhone was 15. All right, so what was P for our class? Well, P, or excuse me, P hat. P hat is X over N. That's 15 over 19, which is, let me grab Desmos, 15 divided by 19 is 0.789. They're not the same. Right? So this is what it was assumed to be, and this is from our sample. Right? So this is the population parameter assumption. It's a proportion, right? So that's the population proportion. And then the this is a sample statistic. Okay. Now Suppose we walk around in the building and go from class to class to class, and we poll students and find each classroom's percentage of iPhone ownership. So we go from room to room to room to room, and you know, count how many students there are, 
how many have an iPhone? How many students are there? How many have an iPhone? Over and over and over and over again. Right? That's called the sampling distribution of sample proportions. We're taking multiple p hats from multiple different samples. So it's the distribution distribution of p hats from lots of samples. All right. Now, if we do that, what's going to happen? Well, the shape is kind of unknown, right? We don't know what the shape is going to be. But we know from past experience that if we want to do anything in this course, we're going to need n to be large enough that we can ensure normal. Then, what about the center? Okay, well, the center, I want it to be, um, well, let's think. If it's really 69%, let's just pretend. If it's really 69% for, for all of US college students, then shouldn't class to class to class be kind of around that 69%? I mean, you'll notice this wasn't, you know, 2%. This was, you know, 79%, which is 10% higher, but still, it's, it's right around there. So the mean for the p-hats, right, the center, which is the mean of all our p-hats, should be, hopefully, the same as what p is. And p was 0.69. So we think that when we go from room to room, we're going to get some rooms that are higher percentage of iPhones, some rooms that are lower percentage of iPhones. But the average of all the different P hats from room to room, or the average of yeah, all the P hats from room to room will be right around 0.69. So this is the average. Let me just say what this is. This is the average. So that's what the mu is, right? It's the average of all the p different p hats from the different samples. Right? So when we go from room to room to room, we think that they should average out to be what the population average was, which was 0.69. All right, now what about the spread? Well, the spread is going to um, be well, I mean, let me put it this way. It's going to change, right? So it's going to be different. So the spread is going to be the standard error of the p hats, right? Okay, so what is that? That is the spread is the variation in the p hats. Right, in the different p hats from the different samples. So if this was the average, this will be the, the variation in the different p hats from the different samples, from the different rooms. And you can imagine that what's going to happen is that it's going to shrink, right? Bigger rooms will have right more effect, right? Less impact. Or how about this? The larger the room, the, the closer it's going to be this, to this 0.69, right? Okay, so is there a formula for it? Why, yes, yes, there is. And it's going to come in a couple pages, but I'll just show it to you. It's this big square root, and we take P times Q over N, right? So that's what it'll be. So it's a big square root, P times Q over N. Now, wait, whoa, whoa. Q. What's Q? So let me just remind you, we learned P and Q back in chapter six, right? So Q is the um, probability of failure. So let me just remind everybody, reminder from section 6.2, right? If P is the probability of success, 
right, the chances they have an iPhone in this case, then Q would be the probability of failure, the chances they don't have an iPhone. And what do they, what quality do they have? Well, Q and P add up to one. Here, let me put it this way. P plus Q makes one. And the way we wrote that back in the day is one minus P. Just a little review, right? We learned all of that in section 6.2, right? With the binomial distribution. So down here, when we get to this base right here, when we have the square root, it'll be 0.69 is my P, but what's my Q? Well, let me write it down. Q is one minus P, which would be one minus 0.69, which would be 0.31. So you're gonna put 0.31 right there. And then we're gonna divide it by N, N was 19. Now that's a pretty brutal formula to, to have to enter into a Desmos, but you will. <laughs> so let me grab Desmos. Okay, and there's a couple ways you can do this. The, first of all, you have to do the square root first. So I type SQRT and it knows what I want. You can also just go to the palette and it's, it's the little check mark guy that looks um, right next to the pie, right? So, but if you type SQRT, it just does it. Okay, let me hide the palette now. Okay, so if you put, um, there's a couple ways to do this. 0.69 parentheses times 0.31 close parentheses divide by 19. Or that's the same thing as 0.69 times 0.31 divide by 19. It's no big deal. If it, as long as there's a division by 19, just one of them, it's fine, because multiplication and division are equal on equal footing in the order of operations. Or you can say square root. You can do the division first, which will make your fraction. And if you do that, so 0.69 times 0.31, and then arrow your way down with your arrow key down to 19. Right? Either way, you get 0.1061. Uh, what was that? 1061 something. I gotta get back to it. I'm losing my decimal places. 1061. Oh, I guess I'll just stop there because the next number is a zero. So we want the distribution to be normal if we can manage it and we're going to. And if it is, then the center will be this and the spread will be this. Obviously, these three things are only going to be true if we can manage the um, conditions for the central limit theorem. So we'll be getting there in just another page or two.